welcome to Wednesday. This video is being pre-recorded because unfortunately I will be at the dentist for much of the morning tomorrow. So if I'm a bit missing in action from the comment section, that's why. Know that I would much, much rather be engaging with you than at the dentist, but alas, adulting calls. Our fall leaves are at their peak right now. I'm hoping wherever you are, you're also getting some color as we move through my most favorite season of the year. I can't believe we're like a week away from Halloween. Anyway, this is YouTube, so if you enjoy the content, please engage with it, whether that be a comment or a like, whatever you want to do, I appreciate it. On to the video. So why do I keep talking about the royal family as it pertains to Harry and Meghan? To be honest, there's personal interest here. It's a topic I like discussing. I find I have a morbid fascination with how one of the biggest institutions of our time just totally fumbled what was an easy, easy pass. I would also like to take a moment to call out the Brits in the comment section who repeatedly ask why I care. To be frank, despite you insisting that no one in the UK cares about American opinion, your own press has said that isn't true. American media markets are important to every global outlet, whether you'd like to admit it or not. At this weekend's Earthshot, it was announced that the next event would be held in America. Maybe it can lose 2 million American viewers from its time slot, too. So for all those who choose to comment, we don't care what Americans think. Try again, because your own royal family definitely does. Now, when most sane people are asked why the royal family and the UK press rejected Meghan Markle, they talk about her race. And they're completely right. Meghan's mixed race heritage certainly doomed her in the eyes of a viciously white royal family, which in turn made her an easy target for the press. Unlike other women who have married into the family at the senior level, she received no press protection, even during the supposed honeymoon period. While I'm not here to dispute the role race played, I'm here to add that I don't think it was the only thing at work. In fact, I think if Harry had shown the same level of public affection or affinity with any woman in 2016-2017, she would have faced a particularly aggressive family and press response. Why? Because, to be blunt, the heir's marriage was entering a period of difficulty. So, for the spare to have such a public love story at the same time, it wouldn't have been tolerated, even if Harry's choice of bride had been a white aristocrat. So is this just another video to talk about heir versus spare? Yes. Should you still watch it? Also, yes. Now, there are a few things that you have to understand for this video to make sense. Topics that have been discussed in some of my other videos. If I can finally figure out how to get cards to work right, there will be links to these videos at the appropriate intervals. The first is that the breakup of Charles and Diana and her subsequent death almost broke the monarchy and has had lasting ramifications for both the current monarch and, more importantly, the heir to the throne. The second is that the current love fest for the Cambridges did not exist, or at least didn't exist nearly to the extent it is now, back in 2016-2017. The third is the basis of heir versus spare. The royal institution will do just about anything to protect the heir, even when in the long run it probably isn't in their best interests. The institution runs on air versus spare. They are wired, built, so the spare pays for any inadequacy of the air, even when that violates natural family relationships. But to understand why the Cambridge marriage was and still is a red line issue for the royal family, we have to talk more about Charles and Diana. Actually, we have to go back even further than that. When you belong to one of the most conservative institutions ever to exist on planet Earth, complete with direct ties to institutional religion, strong heterosexual marital relationships are important. If we go back far enough, royal marriages were pacts between countries, responsible at times for peace or war. Don't worry, we, we don't have to go quite that far back to understand what happened to Harry and Meghan in the late 20 teens. Romance and caring towards a female spouse has long been a way that kings of past and present have been humanized. Royal families are often seen as a model for entire countries, with familial relationships being used as a shield against criticism, but also again as a humanizing factor. 
The king might be untouchable in a lot of ways, but he's also a husband and a father. We have to look no further than both George V and George VI. In both cases, much was made about the connection they had with their wives. On the flip side, denial of marriage slash public romantic relationships has shaped this generation of British royals. Edward VIII would be forced to abdicate, not because he was a Nazi sympathizer, which, to be fair, wasn't really known at the time, but because he wanted to marry an American divorcee. Although there is some question on whether Wallace Simpson had any interest or was able to have children, this directly led to Queen Liz. Princess Margaret was denied her choice of marriage, too. Royal marriages are powerful things in the institution. Some of the only real criticism Philip and Elizabeth faced before Diana's death was after rumors of infidelity. And this makes sense given their long relationship is slash was often used as a boost for both of their reputations. Despite there being some pretty good evidence that Liz and Phil lived separately for decades before his death, including Philip having his own live-in, quote, friend, royal PR has been an overdrive to portray their relationship as a goal for everyone. At the very least, projecting a healthy marriage has been pretty central to the British royal family's PR strategy for at least a hundred years. This would, of course, bring us to Charles and Diana. We don't really need to rehash this. I think we all know the story. What is important to take away is that the 90s would absolutely throw the decades-long royal PR push of successful marriages in the trash. Margaret's divorce in the 70s could be considered an anomaly. But when all three of the Queen's married children announced their respective divorces, two of which having pretty convincing adultery charges and one being the heir to the throne, people start to notice. Although Anne and Andrew's divorces would pale in the face of Charles and Diana's tabloid-melting smear fest, 1992, ironically the year I was born, was truly not a good year for the royal family. Diana's popularity and the following media fixation with her was something the royal family as both human beings and as an institution were just astoundingly unprepared for. Coinciding with the rise of tabloid publications and the 24-hour news cycle, their concocted love story, followed by the intense public crash of that, again, mostly fake love story, would change the face of the royal family. The ensuing smear fest in the press would lead the Prince of Wales, the heir to the British throne and his household, to work with tabloid gutter press in ways previously thought unimaginable. That royal-led smear fest would come back to bite the family in their respective asses when Diana tragically died in 1997. After the disastrous handling of the aftermath, the monarch would face the worst poll numbers of her reign with people so angry that only 30% of those polls thought the monarchy would even survive. Charles' personal reputation has never truly recovered. While I don't think the institution had fully embraced how much of a significant impact the Wales' divorce and Diana's subsequent death would have on them until recently, the royal family as an institution walked away from the disastrous 90s with the plan that the next heir would have to do better. So the question becomes, did the next generation's heir do better? For a while, it seemed like maybe he had. While Kate faced some truly rude press in the 10 years they spent dating, that all seemed forgotten in 2011, when the two married to seemingly much fanfare. Just to further support the institution's knowledge of how bad the Charles and Diana fi- fiasco, fiasco, okay, a lot of Kate's early positive press was about how much she wasn't like Diana. She, quote, knew the job. Their wedding was well-received. I think there was a lot of goodwill towards one of Diana's sons getting married and actually seeming like he wanted to be there. There was no whatever love means moment for Will and Kate. At the time, Harry was playing the lovable screw-up brother. Everything was right in the heir versus spare world. My argument remains and has always been that missteps were taken almost immediately after the Cambridge wedding. The biggest, and one of the decisions I honestly think the royal family has lived to regret, was allowing Will and Kate to be part-time senior royals, a term that had to be made up for them, and was notably denied from Harry and Meghan, but I digress. 
This decision would lead to a lot of the early and honestly continued criticism of the couple, especially when it became obvious that Will wasn't really even working at his, quote, other job. Wasn't being a royal either. The labels lazy and work shy started getting thrown about with really no redirection from the couple or the family. Other than a few press leaks from both Betty and Chuck's camps that they weren't really pleased about the whole thing, but they obviously didn't really do anything about it. This unfortunate decision would last until 2017, a full six years. The second immediate misstep was treating Will and Kate like they were teenagers still figuring out this whole adulting thing. They were both in their late 20s at the time of the wedding and their early 30s when George was born. Not old by any stretch of the imagination, but far from kids who couldn't be held responsible for their lack of work record or enthusiasm at royal events. This infantilization of especially Kate would lead to a mismatch in expectations and even appearance as time went on. While there were some moments of realistic affection between the two early on, these would fade pretty quickly. All of this to say that as the Cambridges approached 2016-2017, things were not great. UK outlets were openly attacking their work record and low engagement numbers. They no longer drove any meaningful press attention. Their tours were sources of constant criticism. I still have to do a video about that. There were photos and videos of William dancing and hanging out with other women. Then there was the big, the bad, the ugly. Although affair rumors would not rear their head publicly until 2019, there is evidence that the press, and I would argue the family, knew about them as early as 2017. Now, during all of this, Harry was again playing the lovable screw-up spare, a useful distraction at times. Although I would argue that as things changed between the Cambridge couple, their awkward third-wheeled public engagements with Harry changed too. Then, in late 2016, things changed for Harry. His relationship with Meghan Markle became public knowledge, and almost immediately everyone knew this one was serious. And, almost immediately, comparisons start. Unlike Kate, Meghan has a public work history. She's a millionaire in her own right with a large social media profile. Compared to the Cambridge story, things moved quickly with Harry and Meghan. When they made their first appearance, holding hands at Invictus, you could kind of feel the shockwaves. Despite the UK press doing what it does best, and possibly one of the worst fathers in recent history, Harry and Meghan were ascendant. And on that trip up, they were obviously and hopelessly in love. So, to recap, at a time where the air couple was publicly facing press criticism and privately allegedly dealing with a barely concealed affair, the spare was enjoying a very public love story. And again, if you know anything about air versus spare, you know that this just isn't going to work. The obvious comparisons between the relationship Will and Kate had versus Harry and Meghan did not benefit Will, the heir. And unlike his father, who had decades of public work history, including long-term projects and partnerships, William had nothing to fall back on. His, quote, normal relationship with his wife was basically the foundation of his public reputation as an adult. The family was faced with another heir whose relationship was falling apart, complete with charges of adultery. Instead of facing that reality head on, the spare was scapegoated. Again. They still have not learned their lesson. Even after almost losing the very monarchy themselves the last go around. William and Kate's relationship continues to deteriorate in public. Despite the daily fail, insisting that two people standing rigidly next to each other in mismatching outfits is truly the essence of romance. So, did William do better? No. He learned nothing from the failures of the 90s, which led to the further breakdown of royal PR. Now on top of that, not only is the future future heir's marriage in continual question for anyone paying attention, William's scapegoat is gone. William nor the institution don't control Harry anymore. The heir has lost his spare. When people say that Meghan paid the price for being a mixed-race American, they aren't wrong. But she also paid a price because the love between her and Harry threatened the heir. 
and in the royal system, that is unacceptable. Thank you guys so much for watching my videos. As usual, uh, I don't know if I'm going to be back tomorrow with mom. I got to figure out something to talk about. Um, but I hope to see you back in this space soon. Thanks. Bye.